Hello, listeners, and welcome to another episode of Cognitive Dissidents. As usual, I'm your host. I'm Jacob Shapiro. I'm a partner and the director of geopolitical analysis at Cognitive Investments. Uh, for the second consecutive week, I'm coming to you solo. And we got a lot of positive feedback from the solo episode last week, so we will keep this under 20 minutes maximum and talk about some of the biggest things that are happening from my perspective and that are on the CI Knowledge Platform geopolitically in the world today. Brief programming note, I will actually be going on vacation next week. John Minnick, who has been on this podcast, is getting married, my old college roommate, and he's getting married in Lisbon. So my wife and I are going to Portugal, leaving the baby uh, with her incredible grandparents and, and taking a week off. So if you're in Lisbon, want to get a, a glass of port or something like that, feel free to drop a line. Uh, you can also always drop a line, Jacob at Cognitive.Investments, if you want to learn more about how to become a CI client. But without further ado, Let's talk about what happened uh, this week in geopolitics. Uh, this was one of the, those weeks where it, it felt like every day was a week <laughs> full of information and things that were happening. The biggest news is obviously the death or the presumed death. I think it's pretty clear he's dead, but I can't say anything 100% for sure in Russia of uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin, who was the head of the Wagner Group who uh, led this mutiny, attempted coup, whatever you want to call it in Russia in late June and has just been walking around, chilling in Belarus, making videos in Africa, sort of being a modern day heart of darkness type figure in Africa. Um, Earlier this week, we had a video of him uh, claiming that he was going to bring more freedom to Africa. And I actually put a note in our CI knowledge platform for clients. How is this dude still alive? And lo and behold, a couple days later, he's not alive. Um, I want to stay on this for a second, though, um, because my analysis of the Progosian mutiny from the beginning was that this is the first real crack we've seen in Putin's Putin's regime. And that Putin may be able to stitch things back together. He may be able to reassert control. But once you have cracks like this in a regime, it's a matter of when, not if, that regime is eventually going to collapse. Now, I am not saying Putin is going to collapse imminently. I've had some people you know, try and push me to putting a time marker on it. If you put a gun to my head, maybe I say two years, maybe I say fewer years than that. It could be multiple years, but it's clear that within the Russian regime, there is problems. And that's what Prigozhin's mutiny meant. And the fact that he has now confirmed dead confirms that analysis from my point of view. We are dealing with a Russian political regime that is fundamentally insecure, that is competitive, where the knives are going to be out, where we're going to see other purges. Um, There was another uh, Russian general uh, who was also removed from his post. I can't remember how to pronounce his name, so I'm not going to say it, but he was leading the Air Force. He was the only top military official to indicate some sympathy with Prigozhin and who went along with it, and he is also gone. I also want to use this, though, to talk a little bit about how to use geopolitics. I do not often get on my soapbox about things, and I'm not very often am I emotional about things related to analysis, but on this particular um, development, I am. Because in the days after Prigozhin's mutiny, uh, the narrative that was spreading like wildfire through social media was that this was all planned, that it was staged between Putin and Prigozhin to get rid of the chief of staff and some other generals, and that you know there would be a handshake deal, and then Prigozhin uh, would get some kind of sweetheart deal on the back end, and everything would be fine. Um, it was a legitimate hypothesis, but it had no evidence It had no basis in fact, and also there is nothing geopolitical about that thesis. Geopolitics is not about what was Prigozhin doing, what was the backroom deal between Putin and Prigozhin. Geopolitics helps us understand what is the meaning of what we're seeing in front of us, but to understand what was happening between Putin and Prigozhin, that's an intel question. You need to be in the room. You need to have direct access to some of the players involved. And unless you have direct access you probably don't know what you're talking about. It's one of those things where those who speak don't know and those who know don't speak. Uh, and But what was really disturbing to me was just how much that latched on and how much the people who were spreading that really unconfirmed narrative that had no basis in fact, how much attention they were getting and how that actually became, oh, this is all part of Putin's plan and everything was fine. Um, that's not how you use geopolitics. Geopolitics, as I said, it's very useful for thinking about what is the future of Russia's regime and the Russian government in the context of what we've seen happen with Prigozhin. Those are the types of questions that geopolitics is really helpful in answering. Geopolitics has nothing to say about, is there a backroom deal between Prigozhin and Putin? Again, that's intelligence. 
that's direct access knowledge that has nothing to do with geopolitics. And anybody who is out there grandstanding that that's geopolitics or who were presenting that is the narrative, I have real problems with those people, not just because they were spreading false information, but because they're giving the geopolitical discipline a bad name. I've been doing this for over a decade. It has taken us as long as I've been doing geopolitics to get any respect for these tools and this discipline at all. And those charlatans out there, when they're selling their pencils from a cup like that, they are damaging the credibility of all these other geopolitical analysts like myself, Marco, and a lot of the people that I try to bring on this podcast who are trying to bring these insights to you. So I wanted to make that point. The last thing about Prigozhin, and I've gotten a number of questions about this via email, and a few of you reached out on LinkedIn, was what does this mean for the Wagner Group in Africa? The honest answer to your question is, well, I'm not really 100% sure what it means for the Wagner Group in Africa. I'm not even really 100% sure what this means for the Wagner Group in general. There were some disturbing videos of Wagner Group fighters saying, oh, like they don't know what they've started. These fighters in Belarus, I would hate to be Lukashenko today uh, dealing with some of these Wagner. I don't know how many fighters are left in Belarus or any are left in Belarus. But as pertains to the Wagner Group in Africa, um, I think that Wagner's influence and power in Africa has been vastly overstated. We had Simtac on the podcast a couple epi- episodes ago, and he went into some depth about how there really wasn't a huge Russian presence in Africa. And to the extent there is, it's very brittle. It's very weak. Remember, go look at a map at Russia. One of Russia's biggest geopolitical challenges, arguably its biggest geopolitical challenge, is that it does not have access to the world's oceans. It is almost completely hemmed in. It's almost a landlocked power. Um, If Turkey turns against Russia and blocks the Black Sea exit from the Russian Navy, rushes up the creek without a paddle, as we used to say on the farm, or if China decides that it wants to do that in the Pacific, or it wants to take back Vladivostok, which was once a Chinese city from the Russians, all those things are at play. It's why the Russians have these fantasies about opening up the Arctic, because they think maybe that's a way for them to access the world ocean. So even if Russia was in force in Africa, incredibly tenuous supply lines, not something they're going to be able to reinforce. They can't even win a war in Ukraine. You don't need to worry about what they're doing in Africa in general. As we've said on the podcast repeatedly, um, what's happening in Africa is a much bigger deal and it has structural issues. It has to do with rising food prices, which I've been well ahead on the curve on warning about. It has to do with the rise of power vacuums and jihadist fighters and um, sort of a breakdown Um, insecurity, stability in the region, and it's beginning to spread. It's beginning to affect places like Nigeria and Ethiopia. I'll get to Ethiopia in a second. Um, And it's about more than Russia. It's a great scramble. And countries like China and Turkey and France and the United States have way, even Canada, Canada, which has troops on the ground in Niger. I didn't even realize that until this week when I was doing some more research. All of these countries have more to say about what's going on in Africa than Russia and certainly will over the long haul because Russia looks like a very weak power uh, and not one that's going to be projecting power into the heart of Africa in the future, even if from a political basis and for all these other reasons, it looks that way. Um, That's a great segue into the second thing to talk about this week, which is this BRICS conference. Um, And I have to confess to you, I'm having a really hard time generating any argument that says this BRICS conference was particularly important. Um, They've decided to welcome in some new members. So welcome to the BRICS. For those of you who don't know, the BRICS is a grouping of Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. It's supposed to be like, you know, the, the, the rising powers of the multipolar world. They've been talking about a multipolar world for a long time. And they've decided to let some new countries into their club. So the new countries that will be joining the BRICS are Argentina, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, uh, Ethiopia, Egypt, and I think I'm, I think I'm, oh, and of course the most controversial one, Iran. Um, so welcome to the BRICS. Um, I don't know what the BRICS is. Do you know what the BRICS is? Can somebody tell me what the BRICS is? They don't have a currency. I think they do have a development bank. It's not a defense treaty. There's no loss of sovereignty or political deals back and forth. It seems to me like it's literally just a conference where leaders get together and rub shoulders and talk about things. And at the 11th hour of the announcement where they were supposed to announce all these new members, there was actually still disagreement. You had Reuters and Bloomberg and everybody else talking about, oh, they may not be able to come to an agreement because there's controversy about which countries they were going to which they were going to let in into the, in the first place. And if you looked at the statements of some of the leaders, sort of what Brazil was saying versus what China was saying versus what Russia was saying, very, very different sentiments coming from all those leaders. And those are all countries with very divergent interests. India, for example, has been moving closer to the United States uh, and also to the European Union, uh, restarting uh, free trade negotiations with the European Union 
uh, reported this week. Brazil, kind of caught in between, is really doing its own thing. South Africa, I mean, uh, we don't have to go through all the bricks. Um, but these are not countries that have the same things in mind. And so they've welcomed in some countries and it doesn't really make sense to me. In some ways, I'm more befuddled by which countries didn't get entry into the BRICS. For instance, if you're going to let in Iran and Saudi Arabia and the UAE, why not Turkey? Turkey's the rising power of the Mediterranean. Turkey's the one with a manufacturing base. Turkey's the one with one of the most formidable militaries in NATO. Is it because they're part of the NATO alliance? I mean, Saudi is a U.S. security ally. Sort of hard to put together why you wouldn't include Turkey in the mix. Note also that Turkey's had tensions with Russia in the last couple of weeks and has been talking up a session with the EU. So maybe there's some kind of shift happening there that we need to be aware of. Um, Ethiopia and Egypt welcomed into the BRICS. Why not Nigeria? Why not the most populous country in Latin, uh, in Latin America? Why not the most populous country in sub-Saharan Africa? Why not the country that is respected as the place where, yes, Nigeria has tons of problems, but it's also where most entrepreneurs want to go. It's to the extent that there is startup nation in Africa. I'd pick Nigeria, certainly over Ethiopia. Um, and we'll talk about Ethiopia's struggles here in a minute. So maybe there's something to that. You're welcoming in Iran. Xi Jinping's speech about BRICS was about everybody following international rules and law and order. Uh, most listeners probably know I'm a little more sympathetic to Iran's case, especially vis-a-vis -vis the United States than most analysts out there. But even me, somebody who is sympathetic to Iran, would be the first to point out that Iran routinely breaks international laws, has no respect for any of these international laws and covenants and things like that. So if that's what China really cares about, they're full of shit. That's just like straight up hypocrisy. Um, and the key thing here is the BRICS don't actually do anything. They don't mean anything. Um, it's not like even the European Union, which is, in, which is an imperfect union and has all these different problems, but at least there's a European Central Bank and a European Court of Justice and all of these other things. The BRICS is what? It's a meeting every once in a while. Congratulations to the countries that got to join it. I'm not losing much sleep about what's going on with the BRICS um, in general. Um, moving on, and we're going to hit some of the members of the BRICS here and some of these other updates. Uh, just a couple words about India. Been a lot of news here about India this week. I already mentioned uh, the imminent restart of free trade negotiations with the European Union. Um, that makes a lot of sense uh, because the European Union, in some way, this is ironic what I'm about to say, is the least imperialistic power that India could negotiate a major free trade agreement. Uh, free trade agreement with the United States wants to enlist India against China. China has its own desires in the Indo-Pacific and the South China Sea and things like that. The European Union is not really a military power in that sense of view. They need new markets, um, and they. India is a perfect uh, test case for that. The problem there is going to be that the European Union is going to have all these stringent rules that India is not going to want to follow. So I'm not sure it's going to go anywhere. But there's that news. Um, there is the news that India is restricting exports of more foodstuffs. So onions and sugar got added to the list this week. Um, you might remember wheat and rice. We've already had some restrictions on exports coming from India. I just want to underscore here in the global south, in the developing world, food prices are rising. Food inflation is rising. The Western narrative and the developed country narrative is that food prices are beginning to go down with a larger drop in inflation. Maybe inflation is going to go down. I'm not an economist, but I'm just telling you what I'm seeing in countries like Nigeria, in countries like India, food prices are rising and they're rising to levels that we saw around 2005 in Nigeria's case, India, not quite so dire, but you're, you're seeing this all over the place. And India's food protectionism, that's a big enough market. It's going to, it's going to move the needle there and it's going to move the needle on wheat and now add sugar, onions, tomatoes. These are all things that India's restricted exports on and important from that perspective. Last but not least, the Indians landed um, a craft on the South Pole of the moon. I can't pronounce the name of the craft. I didn't look it up before the podcast, uh, but congratulations to India for that. That's a major deal. Russia tried to do it last week and failed epically. Um, in my, when I launched my own consulting firm, Perch Perspectives, I put together a report that was a forecast of the 2020s. And one of the first chapters in that, re in that report was predicting this, the second space race, which I said was going to begin in the mid 2020s. And India was one of the countries that I pointed to that was going to be involved in that. Uh, I think you should also look closely at the European Union, the United States and Russia, obviously China, Japan, but India was one of those big players there. Um, and that launch uh, really speaks well to the Indian economy, to in India's uh, technology and development, to its community of scientists, all those other things. So as ever with India, a mixed bag of things, some good things, some bad things, some ambiguous things, uh, but all things that I thought it was necessary to check in about. Um, 
I said I was going to mention Ethiopia. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. I just want to point out the ethnic tensions in the Amhara region and the violence that is happening in the Amhara region is not going away. And the Ethiopian, the Ethiopian government is talking about deploying federal military forces to these restive parts of Amhara region to get everything under control. Um, this, if this continues on this track, this is like the Tigray civil war, but by a factor of three or four. Um, Ethiopia has so much potential, but it really cannot get out of its way. And it looks like it's staring right down the barrel of another civil war. I mean, that's the worst case scenario. I hope it doesn't happen because when you put together everything that's happening in sub-Saharan Africa right now, it would be terrible um, if that is what happened. But that's what the indicators look right now for Ethiopia. Another reason why it's so mystifying to me that the BRICS are like, yes, come in, open arms. You can't even get your own country together, but come into the BRICS where we do nothing uh, but release statements about how we are the multipolar rising world. Um, two more things before I let us go. The first is there was a report, um, I believe in, I can't remember now if it was the Wall Street Journal or Reuters, but it's on the knowledge platform if you want to check it out, that the United States is going to extend exemptions uh, for South Korean and Taiwanese and other companies to bring advanced semiconductor technology into China for their manufacturing bases in China. Um, this is low key, a really, really big deal. And it underscores something I've talked about here on the podcast and that I've talked about with clients for literally years. Yes, the United States has better technology than China. And yes, if the United States wants to impose significant pain on China, technology is a tool that the US can do it, uh, can do that with just understand that China also has leverage here. It may be asymmetric. It may not be as powerful overall as the U.S. leverage, but the U.S. needs China as much as China needs the U.S. And if the U.S. really wants to cut off its leg in order to bring the Chinese economy, in order to cut off both of the legs of the Chinese economy, it absolutely can do that, but it involves losing a limb in the process. There is no version of a complete and total blockage of advanced technology to China or shutting down the Chinese economy or winning the trade war that doesn't also include a global recession and the United States economy going off a cliff for a couple of years. And this is the one thing that China's had in its back pocket the whole time. It's why China's putting pressure on companies like TSMC, like you know other US tech companies, all these other companies that have been lobbying the Biden White House against more restrictive and draconian measures on technology, which we're pushing for these exemptions. Um, and you're beginning to see here the limits of the rhetoric and the ideology when it comes to China, because for better and for worse, even though I think we're moving towards a deglobalized world, even though I say we're moving towards a multipolar world, even though decoupling is happening, look, we're still at the very beginning phases of this. We've been in a, global, a globalization phase from you know basically the end of the Cold War all the way up until the pandemic. That's 30 plus years of globalization. You don't just snap your fingers and unwind that. And we're beginning to see some of the real the realities, the constraints of geopolitics assert themselves there. Last but not least, and it would have been first uh, if not for the Prigozhin news and if not for the fact that I just recorded an amazing podcast uh, with two Latin America experts yesterday that we're going to post on Monday. Um, is the seismic earth uh, the seismic earthquake political earthquake in Guatemala where Bernardo Arevalo has become is elected the new president of Guatemala? I'm not going to step on the podcast episode on Monday. I just um, the the thing I'll just say here is that so much of geopolitics is doom and gloom, and doom and gloom. Part of that is that's what sells. Part of it is also it's just been kind of a gloomy time in the world since the pandemic. Even an optimist like me will point out that there's a lot of war, there's a lot of suffering, there's a rise in poverty and food insecurity. I mean, you start going on the list, there's not a lot, a lot of great things to talk about. Um, and maybe what's what's happening in Guatemala will. Uh, will not live up to its potential, but it's a very, very exciting development. It's a positive development from my point of view. You have a people democratically opting for change and for a candidate who seems to be offering change and honest change at that. So we will have a full hour long discussion with our experts on Monday. Um, and also listeners, I've been recording podcasts pretty furiously over the course of the last two weeks. So you will not miss an episode even while I'm gone. We've got some great content coming for you even while I'm on vacation, uh, and I will get back with you in about in a week, a half's time with another update. Um, so I said less than 20 minutes. It says 19 minutes and 30 seconds on the clock with the disclaimers that will probably get over that. So I'll say bye. Hope you're all doing well. Cheers and see you out there. Thank you so much for listening to the Cognitive Dissidents podcast brought to you by Cognitive Investments. If you are interested in learning more about Cognitive Investments, you can check us out online at cognitive.investments. 
That's cognitive.investments. Uh, you can also write to me directly if you want at jacob at cognitive.investments. Cheers, and we'll see you out there. The views expressed in this commentary are subject to change based on market and other conditions. This podcast may contain certain statements that may be deemed forward-looking statements. Please note that any such statements are not guarantees of any future performance, and actual results or developments may differ materially from those projected. Any projections, market outlooks, or estimates are based upon certain assumptions and should not be construed as indicative of actual events that will occur.